Favourite time of the week, the reason we broadcast in HD. None other than the wonderful Megan Kelly joining us from the United States. Of course, the show Sirius XM, or you can find it on podcasts and YouTube. How are you, Rockstar? I'm so good. Wonderful to be back with you. Lovely to see you. So, NPR. Now, in Australia, we have, uh, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest media players is fully taxpayer funded. Uh, NPR is not quite as fully funded as a BBC or an ABC, but it's got an awful lot of money in it, as well as a bunch of, uh, a bunch of donations. But basically, it's a bunch of people who've been whispering at us and having a conversation. Uh, and somebody from the inside has now turned around and said, the people there are nuts. Yes, it's extraordinary. So I read this guy's post in the free press and I'm reading it and he starts out by saying he works there, currently works there. And I love how he, he begins it by establishing his bona fides as a leftist. Just so we all know, this isn't some, is not some secret conservative who somehow managed to find his way into NPR. Listen George to this, Paul. He says, I'm a Sarah Lawrence educated, was raised by a lesbian peace activist mother. I drive a Subaru, and Spotify says my listening habits are most similar to people in Berkeley. I fit the NPR mold. So there he, he's got us. Okay, I accept him as a leftist. I, right. I agree so far. Right. And then he just rips the organization to shreds as having completely lost its journalistic way. He says at one point he went and did a little poll to see um, what were the voting registrations of the people who work in the D.C. Bureau of NPR. And it was 87 registered Democrats working in editorial positions. Guess how many Republicans? Zero. Duckies. Not one. He raised this with up with higher ups. No one cared. The, the president wouldn't take a meeting with him. Like, the ideological bias is not a problem. He talked about how their coverage of Donald Trump really did them in and how they went from covering a president to actually trying to topple a president. Then they lost their minds after George Floyd and, of course, changed the entire mission of NPR from journalism to DEI everything. Everything needs to be about race and gender and so on. It didn't do anything to change a single viewer's listening habits or watching habits of NPR. They didn't increase their black watchers, their Hispanic watchers at all, because newsflash NPR, blacks and Hispanics are just like whites. They just want to be entertained and find out news that's going to affect their real lives, like their pocketbook and their immigration concerns and so on. They don't, they're not obsessed with your weird woke DEI stories, which NPR is learning, but apparently not internalizing. And so he goes through this saga that really leaves you completely flabbergasted at how lost this group is on the identity front. Okay, I've got to read this to you, okay? He's got, he lists the number of like BIPOC, et cetera, DEI groups that they now have at NPR. You've got to hear it to believe it. The mm. marginalized genders and intersex people of color, the migente, meaning the Tinks employees at NPR, NPR, no R. <laughs> it's the black employees. <laughs> There's no NPR Blanc, for the record. <laughs> the Southwest Asians and North Africans at NPR. The UMA for the Muslims. The women, gender expansive and transgender people. Why do we have to get lumped with the transgenders? Mm. Uh, the Kevra for the Jewish. The NPR Pride, which is LGBTQIA, and we could keep going. It's, they don't have any time to do any news reporting. All they have time to do is meet with their affinity groups. And this is why he accurately points out that they used to have Republican viewers. It used to be kind of split. One third, one third, one third. Republicans, independents, and Democrats at NPR. And now it's two thirds Democrats and one third people who thought they were tuning into something else. I mean, it's, it's lost. And this is just one example, but this could be extrapolated to any one of the mainstream media outlets in our country and probably yours too. Well, and it seems that because there are, you know, the awards and the affirmation only comes from the left policing its own culture, saying, if you've been a good boy, if you've been a good girl on, on what we consider to be the issues, here's all of the statues, right? Um, then there's people like you and I who go, who cares? Um, let's talk about a whole bunch of stuff. But what I find particularly odd is the feedback loop that they always accuse the right of is way louder on the left. Like, way louder, where essentially, you know, uh, three anonymous sources to Rolling Stone becomes the obsession of MSNBC, becomes reinforced by an NPR, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
You know, I was thinking about this recently. Um, I don't want to get into the specifics of whose kids I'm talking about, but there was a story about some well-known people who have multiple trans or non-binary kids in the family. And all I could think was this story is appearing more and more in about leftist celebrities or billionaires or what have you. And I genuinely think that they don't know what to do when this happens with their child because of this feedback loop, because they immerse themselves in only one kind of media and they shrug off all, everything that would be on the right or perceived right as propaganda. And therefore, they would never read a book like Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage and know that if your child starts expressing gender confusion, there are real steps you can take and that you shouldn't take in order to rescue them. Like, number one, don't go to a therapist without making damn sure it's not somebody who's been captured by the affirm, affirm, affirm crowd, which is the official line with the American Academy of Pediatrics and amongst the psychiatry experts. Do take your kid and go to Europe for three months. Go on a van trip across America. Unplug. Get your child away from Reddit and Insta and all of the online feeds that feed them this trans insanity all day long. They don't know, Paul. They don't know this information because they think everybody over here is just some bigot, you know, who doesn't care about children. Well, what if we do? What if your kid yeah. was just confused and then you let them go down a path that in over 90% of the cases, social transition will lead to medicalization and ultimately surgery and a whole lot of heartache he or she probably never needed to have. So the, the information loop that, that you get caught in, and it can happen on the right too, Absolutely. but you never check out the other side, is not just disturbing, pernicious, it's dangerous. It's gotten dangerous. Well, I always sort of think that, you know, contrary to popular belief, um, you know, I have an opinion, but I don't believe it's the only one in the world. So I hope that just like you're supposed to have a, a steady and balanced diet, your balanced diet is meant to have lots of different opinions and hopefully from lots of different places. I like that Wait, they've settled on yourself and... About this? Yeah, you go. Uh, sorry, I, I just want to make one other point on this um, before we move on to, to something else. Here's, here's one of the problems that we're having, though. Because I am one of those people who doesn't want to get my mind corrupted by, you know, the right-wing silo or the left-wing silo. So I do listen. I, I take in almost all of my news via podcast these days. I don't, I don't like, you know, cable news anymore. I do read uh, some newspapers, but there's such propaganda. It's tough. Anyway, the problem is, for example, here in the States, I was listening to um, this one from the right wing. And then this, and the, on the left, one of the podcasts was NPR. And what's happened steadily over the past few years, Paul, with NPR, is it's gotten so partisan yeah. that I no longer trust their facts. I used to understand spin, but I now no longer trust I'm getting facts. Like they reported over and over and over again that the lab leak theory had been disproven about COVID. Like that's been totally debunked. That was a lie. No, it hadn't. Mm. And so you get to the point where you're like, I don't, I can't trust them even for facts with left wing spin anymore. And honestly, the same is true on the right. Mm. They also now have their own weird facts that they cherry pick and give to you like it's the full story about, let's say, Israel. And then you're supposed to say, okay, all right, I guess this is everything I need to know. And then it's their agenda pushing too. So you really have to work so hard to get an accurate news picture in today's day and age. Yep, correct. But as long as the red meat on the middle of the table, the meat and two veg, Megan Kelly, Paul Murray, there you'll be fine. You'll be fine, whichever way you go. All right, let's talk <laughs> about right. Trump. Uh, and uh, another trial, it starts up, uh, this is, of course, the... Now, again, I hate when they say it's the Stormy Daniels case. It's not. It's about the accounting of the payment to Stormy Daniels' case, which, again, once you start to say that, your eyes understandably glaze over. But it's in New York. Jury selection, uh, you know, uh, questionnaires have gone out. He'll be found guilty because it's New York. So what's the worst that happens out of this trial for him? Well, you've got some leftist legal commentators saying he actually might get jail time because he's a recidivist. I'm like, mm. okay, that's Andrew Wiseman, former general counsel at the FBI. How is he a recidivist? Just because he's been charged in three other cases? That generally means you've committed multiple crimes. You keep committing them. You keep re returning to the same crime. That, that's, not, that's not Trump at all. So I don't think there's any real risk of jail time. But now the Democrats are salivating over the possibility of house arrest. 
Could, mm. could they keep him locked up during the entire campaign season or, you know, put the voters in a situation where they have to vote for a guy with an ankle bracelet on? That None of that's going to happen. Um, so I don't think he's looking at more than fines um, and effectively a, a slap on the wrist. But the whole thing really is an outrage. And this is one of those cases where we really have to ask ourselves, do we believe the polls? Because the polls show that about one third of Republicans and one half of independents say if he becomes a convicted felon, it would be a game changer for them. Well, do they mean in this case? Because this is a kind of a stupid case. Like, do they, yeah. Are they persuaded by this hard partisan Alvin Bragg who nobody before him would take the case, even in his own office? The feds wouldn't do this case before it got to him. And it's about, as he's explaining, like a, he didn't document his hush money payment to Stormy Dan. Like, oh, okay. Um, I don't know. But if they do believe that, then a lot of damage will be done to Trump in the lane that he most cares about. Not so much three days in jail, but the electoral lane. I mean, and, and that, this is, the, like, the real problem here is that if those half independents and one-third of Republicans mean it, Trump's really screwed because it means they won't vote for him in the general, which means he won't be president again, which means he is going to jail because he's he's got to worry about those two federal cases in particular, which will 100% send him to jail if he is convicted. So it's just a cascade of events that's about to start happening this Monday. But also, when we talk about, when they talk about the potential jailing of Donald Trump, uh, because we are talking about a, for, uh, a former president, he still has a security service detail, meaning what? They have to sit in the cell next to him, which would suggest to me that the most likely outcome of this stuff is home detention. But if home detention means he can still speak on the internet, well, clearly that's not going to matter. But ironically, if, if, if he was given two months home detention in the middle of an electoral cycle, and he wasn't allowed to communicate during that period of time, while that's a gross miscarriage of electoral justice, shutting up for a couple of months might actually help his polls. Yeah, he probably, if he pulls a Joe Biden campaign, you know, yeah. down to the basement and be quiet, he'll win. Yeah. He'll win. He did, the biggest thing Trump can do to hurt himself between now and Election Day is to keep going out there. His base is already shorn up. He doesn't have to worry about them. The independents, the less they see of Trump, the more they like him. That's why his numbers went back up over the Biden two plus years so far. Um, so that's not in his nature. So if a court were ever to rule that, it would be to his benefit electorally. But if that's not, I just don't see that happening. I just, I, I think this is going to be effectively a slap on the wrist, and it will put to the test whether just the idea of voting for a convicted felon, even though the charges are completely trumped up, will stop the voters that I mentioned from supporting him. I've got my doubts. I just. I just have a tough time believing it, but then I've learned enough times, sometimes you discard the polls at your own peril. Sometimes they're wrong, and sometimes they're really right, and then you look silly. Yeah, 100% with you, 100% with you. So Beyonce's in her country phase right now. Um, okay, um, I get it. You know, this ain't Texas, it ain't Hold'em. Uh, my kids just say that over and over and over and over and over again. It's a nice start to a song. But uh, the next version has a bit of Dolly Parton's Jolene in it, but apparently this is empowering. Has she actually read the words that she was singing? Can I tell you something? Like, why do we have to... It's fine that they make a queen out of Beyoncé. I don't yeah. totally understand why. I mean, she's a, she's a good singer. I, she's talented. I, I I don't deny that. Why does it have to be, yes, queen, queen bay? <laughs> no, she's not a queen. People like her music. She sings some good music. That's it, okay? She didn't cure cancer. She's not Marie Curie. Calm down. Um, but So now she decides to, to take a step into the country lane, and the, it's like, country music has been remade. It's rem Is it? Okay, we have a new player in country music. Country music has been around for a long, long time. It goes right to the heart of America. And most Americans in red states have been loving and enjoying it long before Queen Bay decided to stick her big toe into the lane. But fine, okay, she comes over. She makes an album, which, of course, because she's queen, has Amazing. gotten the thumbs up and the promotion from Michelle Obama, oh. from Vice President Kamala oh. Harris, from... Paul McCartney from Dolly Parton herself. She's no dummy. She called everybody and said, I need you to do me this favor and say you love my album, which they did. Back me in. But she takes Jolene, which is such a catchy song by Dolly Parton. And Jolene, one of the most interesting thing about that song, in addition to its catchy tune, is the story it tells. It tells the story of a very insecure woman 
who sees another woman who she thinks and strongly believes is much more attractive than she is with her auburn hair and her green I eyes. I love the auburn and hair she line. knows, yeah, and she, well, she knows Jolene can steal her man away. Now, this doesn't say good things about her man, but she knows that it could happen. And instead of, like, going over and threatening Jolene, what she does is begs Jolene not to take her man away. She begs her, saying, I know you could do it, but I'm begging you, please don't, because for me, he's the only guy there is. And that's an interesting window into an insecure woman's heart. Um, and it's also kind of clever because she flatters Jolene like it's a smart but insecure woman. Anyway, that's the story of the song, or at least it used to be. Queen Bey got her hands on the song, and God forbid she sing anything that make her look less than, you know, all empowered with the muscle. And so now she's got to change it to, if you come by my man, I'm basically going to beat the hell out of you. I'm going to okay. beat you up. Is th those are the, right? Like, take that, biatch. And she uses the B word in the song. Ooh. And she's tr she turned Jolene into her version of a yeah. badass. Because that's what modern day feminism looks like. By the way, completely missing that the true power move is to write a song about Jolene not even worrying about this. Jolene has no worries because her man loves her and is committed to her and would never cheat on Jolene. So the most beautiful woman in the world could come walking by. She's good. But Queen Bey doesn't understand that. She's got to pretend she's tough, which only telegraphs to those of us who are paying attention that she isn't. The whole thing is bass backwards, and I object. Yeah, also, the uh, look, you know, if, if this current version, uh, the redoing ain't doing it for you and the Dolly Parton one is a little bit too old for you, can I play Goldilocks here for a second? There's a magnificent version that Miley Cyrus uh, did. Uh, it's very sort of low-key and she's kept on all of her clothes for most of it. Um, it's a good version of it if you get the chance. All right, last one I here. I will listen to that. I'll send, it to you. I'll send it to you straight after this. Now, uh, Back to the Future is a uh, musical which is playing on Broadway right now and a lot of people when they come from Australia to go to New York they want to go and see a show why is back to the future the show they should go and see I love this show I I have been spending the past two years ripping on Broadway Doug and I went to see Macbeth it was woke Macbeth, Macbeth where the king's son was being played by a girl with blue spiky hair there was no wardrobe somebody was wearing a Mickey Mouse shirt the guy opened it up <laughs> in a wheelchair, it was majority minority, even though it was 1400 Scotland. It was, what? This is not Shakespeare. This is not Macbeth, okay? Yeah. Then my daughter went to one, it was all about female empowerment and Juliet. What would Juliet's? That was all trans people kissing on state. Okay. Um, mm. You get the bathrooms when you go to intermission, use the one that correlates with your gender identity, whatever. Okay, so I've had it with Broadway till now. Back to the Future is just like the movie, it's perfectly done. There's no wokeism. The acting and the singing is superb. The performances will have you out of your seat, laughing, dancing, singing, fun for the whole family. I, You and your spouse, you could go alone. You could bring your kids, college kids, eight-year-old, all the same. Everyone will love it. And I just, I give it five out of five stars. Trust me, you'll love it. If they actually want to sell tickets, forget what the New York Times says. Put Megan Kelly's review on the billboard and you'll sell even more tickets. Thank you, Rockstar. Lovely to see you. Talk to you soon.